This video is brought to you by HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code ROYALOCEAN14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. Like a lot of you, I'm sure, I am endlessly fascinated by the stories that emerge from nightmarish film productions. There's Francis Ford Coppola practically going insane on the set of Apocalypse Now. Martin Scorsese threatening to shoot a studio executive over changes demanded for the climax of Taxi Driver. Werner Herzog actually pulling a gun on Klaus Kinski during the making of Aguirre. Stories that have been told so many times over the years that they've slipped into the realm of legend and myth. Stories that all too often pit the filmmaker against the studio in the battle for creative control. That particular battle is a key story in the career of one Joe Dante, who got his start in Roger Corman's camp before transitioning into the studio system in the early 1980s. We got the mistaken impression that all you have to do to work for a big studio was show up on these sound stages with all these technicians and do whatever you want. We discovered quickly when we did our next pictures that that wasn't the way it worked. So today we're going to hone in on three specific films from his lineup that help tell the story of Dante's battle with Hollywood and we're gonna frame it in the most appropriate way possible. A quote from Dante himself. As for Looney Tunes back in action, the less said, the better. It was a nightmarish year and a half of my life that I'll never get back, and if I had it to do over, I wouldn't. The final release version has a different beginning, middle, and end than the one I signed on to do. Every day was another battle with people who would have never walked across the street to see the movie. In other words, Looney Tunes back in action was Dante's Inferno. Now we have to backpedal a little bit because the story of what happened to back in action is very much tied up in the story of a little studio you may have heard of before, called Warner Brothers. Yes. For as synonymous as WB is with animation, it took them quite a long time to get into the game of producing animated feature films. They helped distribute a bunch of features done by other studios, UPA's Gay Paris, Lucasfilm's Twice Upon a Time, a couple of films by Don Bluth, but the only features that they themselves produced were repackaged compilation films of old Looney Tunes and Merry Melody shorts. In fact, WB's animation department as a whole went through a pretty tumultuous period, actually being shut down at one point in the late 1960s, before eventually finding a steady footing within the world of television in the early 90s. And then Disney happened. No, no, no. Inspired by the massive box office successes of Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin, and The Lion King, and everything we now refer to as the Disney Renaissance, everybody in La La Land suddenly found themselves racing to grab a piece of the pie. And WB followed in the footsteps of 20th Century Fox, Universal, and DreamWorks when they set up a brand spanking new division, Warner Brothers Feature Animation. Which pretty much wound up being a total cluster for <laughs> Seriously, someone needs to write a book about everything that went down. To start, out of the six films that they produced, all but one were gigantic flops, all of them had horrendous marketing campaigns, but most importantly was that WB was practically on a mission to make these productions as hellish as possible. Oh, we're starting to document this thing now that everything's <laughs> over and Warner's is shutting down. A quote from Brad Bird. The thing is, you can't jump into animation. It's not like live action in the sense that there are a lot of freelancers out there you can collect at will any moment. In animation, teams are made over time. It's more like an orchestra that gets used to playing together. And the only one that was dedicated to a future in animation at that point was Disney, so they had a honed animation team. But every other studio wanted to jump in, so they got whoever was available, like live action. And you can't do that unless you really know what you're doing. They spent a lot of money and didn't really yield very much. Another quote, this time from one of Quest for Camelot's lead animators. It was top heavy. All the executives were happily running around and playing executive, getting their corner offices. But very few of them had any concept about animation at all, about doing an animated film. It never occurred to anybody at the top that they had to start from the bottom and build that up. 
The problems were really coming from the inexperience of everyone involved. Those were people from Disney that had the idea that you just said, do it and it gets done. It never occurred to them that it got done because Disney had an infrastructure in place, working like clockwork. We didn't have that. By all accounts, the feature animation division was a mess, with studio leadership rushing films into production before they were properly prepped, truncating their schedules, and micromanaging the life out of them. Cats Don't Dance was forcibly retooled multiple times against the filmmaker's wishes, Quest for Camelot's team was constantly being fired and replaced, and although there isn't a ton of information, what is out there suggests that Osmosis Jones went through its own kind of production hell. <laughs> Interestingly, The Iron Giant was one of the only movies in that six-film lineup not micromanaged to death, because after Quest for Camelot flopped in 1998, WB started rethinking the whole animated feature film thing. Oh. Yeah. And as a result, they pretty much let Brad Bird and his team do whatever they wanted. Which, spoiler alert, is probably the reason why it's one of the greatest, if not just the greatest, animated film of all time. It's almost like talented people make really good things when they're just left alone. Smack dab right in the middle of this whole circus were the Looney Tunes. Oh, wait, you pesky wabbit. I've got you now. Out. Space Jam was a massive success, and WB spent years trying to get a follow-up film off the ground. At one point, it was going to be Spy Jam with Jackie Chan, then Race Jam with Jeff Gordon, Skate Jam with Tony Hawk, Tiger Woods was involved at one point, before we eventually got to where we are now with a true sequel starring LeBron James. Which, hint hint nudge nudge, has had its own hellish production. But before this, of course, came Looney Tunes back in action. I thought of it as a sacred trust because Chuck Jones was a friend of mine. He wasn't happy with Space Jam because he thought it misrepresented the characters. I signed on to this movie very soon after Chuck's passing to be the Keeper of the Flame and to make sure the characters were presented in the classic tradition, to which I think we succeeded. The actual making of the movie was a very contentious enterprise because the powers that be didn't really want to make the movie, but the marketing department did, so there was a lot of tension as to what kind of movie it should be and what the humor was. It was really not a pleasant situation for a year and a half of your life to be making a Bugs Bunny movie that no one's happy on. You're fired. What? But you- You got rid of our best duck. <laughs> you can't fire me! You know, there's a great irony in the fact that a movie whose inciting incident is one of idiotic studio interference was itself a victim of idiotic studio interference. Well, it has come to this, has it? I'm afraid the Brothers Warner must choose between a handsome matinee idol or this miscreant perpetrator of low burlesque. Whichever one's not the duck. <clears throat> like the troubles faced on Cats Don't Dance and Quest for Camelot, Back in Action was, by all accounts, overseen by a bunch of studio suits who not only micromanaged the film to death, but who didn't seem to understand the way that animation works. I made a video several years ago about how animated films are edited and how it almost looks backwards when compared to live action. Story reels are edited together from sketches and storyboards, scratch dialogue and temp music are added, and every scene from the movie gets finessed multiple times where they're rewritten and polished as much as possible, and only then does the actual animating begin. It's not like making a live-action movie where you can fairly easily make last-minute big changes within the edit. The further you get into an animated film's production, the harder it gets to go back and change what's already being animated. And it's like WB had no idea that that's how it worked. <coughs> oh pain, oh agony! The problem with that movie came when the studio executives started to get tired of our jokes and wanted us to change them. But of course, the animation is done to the voices, and not the other way around. It was difficult trying to convince them that you don't just bring in 25 gag writers and try to write a joke that's short enough to put in somebody's mouth. Where is my humongous rock? And yet, despite all of the trouble that the crew went through, Back in Action is a pretty decent movie. It's not that good, but it's perfectly serviceable. And... In honor of the sequel that just came out, I would just like to add that Back in Action 
is better than Space Jam. Page seven, Daffy gets blasted. Haha, <laughs> page eight, Daffy gets blasted again! Now, Joe Dante has had a long history with all things Looney Tunes. Bugs and Daffy are the perfect introduction to the anarchy of Gremlins 2. The demon rabbit monster in his Twilight Zone segment is pretty reminiscent of the Tasmanian Devil. And the School and Explorers is literally named Chuck Jones Jr. High. And I actually think that you could make the argument that that name, Chuck Jones Jr. High, sums up his movies in the best of ways. They're live action cartoons. Zany and comic and anarchic and completely preposterous and chock full of a childlike sense of limitless imagination, which made him the absolute best choice to helm a Looney Tunes feature. Help you. <coughs> Ducks. He gets these characters and the madcap tone of the classic shorts in such a perfect way, and the brightest spots of the film demonstrate that to a T. You know, when people talk about being impressed by Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which, don't get me wrong, was and still is impressive, they miss talking about Back in Action, where the magic trick of combining and compositing the two mediums together is even more seamless. What Dante and animation director Eric Goldberg and their entire team were able to accomplish here is second to none. Also, I would just like to mention the fact that this movie has a scene in which Roger Corman is depicted directing a Batman movie. That's not right! Cut! Cut! I'm up. I'm, I'm good morning. Hey, Batman, you good? All right. I would like to live in a world where that could become a reality. It isn't without its own set of flaws, however, the most notable being what you could call the human problem. The whole cast does their best, and they're all perfectly fine. Steve Martin is basically playing a Looney Tune, and he's a ton of fun. We cannot let the good guys win this time, people. We must capture this son of a spy, and we must locate the diamond and use its powers for our own diabolical ends. <laughs> the problem is that they don't need to be there in the first place. I like all of these actors, but at the risk of stating the absolute most honest and obvious thing in the world, I'm not there for them. Well, hey, can I take a picture? Oh, please. It's like there's this weird studio mandate that says every time you combine live action and animation together, your animated characters have to play second banana to your big name celebrities. And I've just never understood it. You! 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 Him! Her! Them! Yeah. Equal screen time between the two makes sense in the context of Space Jam, which follow the same ages-old crossover strategy of something like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, where the formula was basically just popular IP plus popular IP equals success. But that's not really the case here. The human characters just feel tacked on for no other reason than, hey, it worked for Space Jam and that made us a lot of money here at WB, so we clearly know what we're doing. Look, if you can do a Muppets movie without having to drag in a couple of bankable leads to take over, then there's no reason why you can't do a Looney Tunes movie in the exact same way. Exactly like it was with Roger Rabbit, having the tunes in a live-action world is a great setting, and following them as they run around the Warner Brothers backlot as they do in the opening act is a really fun update on the same kind of thing they did in the short films all the time. So much so that when revisiting back in action for this video, I just kept thinking, I would love to just see an entire movie of this, the tunes running around the backlot for an hour and a half. That'd be a blast. There are some very nice things in it, but it was my last studio movie because it wasn't a pleasant situation. The irony was that after all the battling back and forth about the content of the movie, it didn't make any money because they took the cartoons off television and the kids didn't know who Bugs Bunny was, so they didn't show up at the box office. If Dante's Inferno was a hellscape marked by an absence of creative control, 
then purgatory was the climb towards a paradise where it was the defining factor. It was a mountain he and his crew climbed, suffering through storms and avalanches, and occasionally the very ground falling out from beneath them. That was the story of explorers. It's pretty neat, huh? Dante signed on to direct just a few months after the success of the first Gremlins, but for as much as he was excited and inspired by Eric Luke's script, he did have his reservations about where it went in its third act. When he brought this up to Paramount, the studio behind the project, he was told that they could just, you know, figure it out as they went along which, although certainly not ideal, wasn't automatically a bad omen, as that kind of improvisation had worked and would continue to work for Dante's films. A lot of the puppetry work in Gremlins was improvised, based on the crew's limitations with what they could feasibly execute. The Burbs was filmed during a writer's strike and wound up featuring quite a bit of improv as a result, so it wasn't necessarily a lackluster third act that was the problem for explorers. The problem, surprise, surprise, was paramount. The production was already a race against the clock. Dante came on board in late 1984 and had less than a year to meet the film's initial release date in August of 1985. But before the cameras could finish rolling, Paramount was thrown into disarray when three of their top dogs decided that their time was up, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg leaving to join Disney and Barry Diller joining Fox. It's not entirely clear why their replacements decided to make the decision that they then did, but for whatever reason, Explorer's release date was pulled back from late August to early July. And in the spring of 1985, Dante and his crew were literally instructed to just stop working. Whatever they had at that point, whatever shape their cut was in, that was the film that was going to be released. As a result, Explorers was, in Joe Dante's words, an unfinished film when it hit theaters. And it shows. Even if you saw it and knew nothing about the production's troubles, you'd most likely come away thinking that it felt, at best, patchy. The love story with Ethan Hawke and his crush feels hacked to pieces, Dick Miller's storyline is set up and then immediately dropped and never returned to, and then of course there's that third act, which we'll come back to in a moment. Yes, next time you get to compete for our grand prize of fabulous new Pontiac Firebird! It's a brand new car! Curiously enough, 1985 was a strangely rough year for the industry, with overall ticket sales down nearly 20% when compared to 1984. And a part of that were a significant number of science fiction and fantasy films that people just didn't show up for. More than likely, there was a saturated feeling in the marketplace, with everybody trying to nab a piece of the real estate that Spielberg and Lucas had been mining so effectively in recent years. So, when a movie like Explorers came along, it probably just felt exactly like everything else. Also, its release was entirely overshadowed by a little thing held the same weekend, called Live Aid. By the end of its theatrical run, Explorers grossed less than $10 million off of a $25 million budget but it's had a pretty good life ever since. Like a number of Dante's other films, it found a second life on home video where it really thrived. Now, unlike Looney Tunes back in action, I didn't see this until fairly recently, so I had none of the potentially blinding nostalgia for it that a lot of people have. But let me tell you, despite all of the troubles that they went through while making the film, it still works pretty well. Explorers is really good junior high sci-fi. It follows the standard Dante story of dorky kids discovering dangerous super toys and mixes it with Close Encounters' shared vision that connects them with an extraterrestrial life and the blueprints provided to construct a spacecraft in order to rendezvous that we'd later see in Robert Zemeckis' Contact. Very few people like this movie apart from me, but it actually reminded me quite a lot of what Brad Bird did a few years ago with Tomorrowland. Both films center around a stargazing lead character yearning for escape who are struck with a vision that propels them towards another world, 
They run into an older character along the way who has their own particularly mysterious connection with that other world. And each film not only has a bone to pick with the way that violence is depicted in media, but went through a rough post-production period and has a third act that just about everybody was disappointed by. But where Tomorrowland's third act was jam-packed and preachy and tried to do way too much, Explorers, many people felt, was the opposite, that it was anticlimactic. Spoiler, but the kids make it to the alien ship, hang out for a bit, watch some TV, and then go home. And that's that, cut to credits. It's by no means a precise ending, but I do think that there are a couple of interesting ideas that Dante and Eric Luke were trying to work through. For one, there's this interesting angle that the movie takes about our relationship with pop culture, and the way that pop culture references can practically become a language in and of themselves. He, he's about to say something. What's up, Dad? What? Like a lot of Joe Dante's leads, Ethan Hawke's character is obsessed with science fiction and fantasy and monster movies. And when he arrives in the alien ship, he finds that they're the same. They know all about us. It's from watching this stuff. <laughs> Where Close Encounters had humans and aliens communicate through music and contact through prime numbers, communication in Explorers is through sound bites from television shows and old movies. Thank you, thank you, you're great. Let's start tonight's show with a medley of your favorites. Remember this one? The amazing Kitchen Companion. It slices, slices, mints, and quinces. Even makes french fries, shoestring, or pickle cut. But wait, that's not all. And Dante actually has quite a history with the core of this idea. It harkens back to the very first project he became known for in the late 1960s. A seven-hour collage film called, and this is real, The Movie Orgy. Let me try and give you an idea of what this thing was. Have you ever gotten on YouTube and watched compilation videos that people have put together of, like, old commercials from the 1970s and 80s? He likes it! Hey, Mikey! When you bring life home, don't tell the kids it's one of those nutritional cereals you've been trying to get them to eat. You're the only one who has to know. The movie Orgy was tapping into the same thing. It was a supercut before supercuts existed, this walk down memory lane made up of clips from TV shows and B-movies and old newsreels and commercials all chopped together. And beloved cartoon characters will come to a theater near you. <laughs> Figaro, Honest John and Gideon, Jiminy Cricket, and Elsa Martinelli as The Whip Girl, Anthony Quinn as Kubra Khan. <laughs> And what he does here in Explorers feels very much like an extension of that same basic idea. All of these shared references, lines from Looney Tunes and late night hosts and movies we've seen a thousand times are so hardwired into our minds that they're adapted and inundated into our collective vernacular to the point where you could probably have an entire conversation with another person just made up of lines from Seinfeld and The Simpsons and The Office. But perhaps even more curious is that the movie kind of ultimately winds up being this meditation on disappointment. Your people have been visiting our planet for, well, well since ancient times. And now you've come back to check up on us and, and explain everything, right? It's a very interesting story. It doesn't make any sense at all. Are you aware of that? Each of the boys' lives are messy and difficult in their own particular way, and when they take flight in the third act, it's a grand moment of escapism where they can leave behind the drudgeries of their lives on Earth. But instead of crossing the final frontier and finding transcendent beings or an intergalactic war, they stumble upon what are really just a couple of kids who took their dad's spaceship out for a spin and who were obsessed with all the same things that they are. Maybe I'm reaching too far, but what I think Dante and Eric Luke were trying to get at is that the grand moments that we look forward to are usually never quite as grand as we imagined they're going to be. It's about the acceptance of the ordinary and even the mundane, and that escapism, or the pursuit of escapism, 
is not always the right path to take, as it can distort the view you have of life and the world around you. It's a bit of a bittersweet ending in that regard, one of reconciliation rather than victory. I don't think that it comes together that fully. It's it's interesting more than it is satisfying, but I'll give credit where I think credit is due. It's a movie that's at least trying to talk about something, that's trying to be about something, when so many films in this genre attempt very little. It's just a shame that Dante and the team weren't able to properly finish as they should have been able to. Dante's purgatory isn't just defined by the suffering that occurs when creative control is thwarted, but the fact that it's a proving ground where paradise is earned, and the fact that a movie like Explorers hangs together and is actually pretty good in the face of all the problems that occurred while making it, is kind of astounding. Okay, so I've spent this entire video ragging on studios and executives for their asinine and insufferable antics, but to give the devil his due, whether by intention or just oversight, sometimes you get a little miracle. <laughs> the original Gremlins was a massive hit for our friends at Warner Brothers, grossing over $200 million. Now, WB had been trying to develop a sequel for years, but Joe Dante had absolutely no interest. Because, really, what would you do with a straightforward Gremlins sequel other than just do the exact same thing again? But. Because that original film was so successful, and because they were quite possibly just in desperate need of a hit, they did the unthinkable. If you will direct Gremlins 2, Warner Brothers told Dante, we will give you complete creative control. Gremlins 2 is a movie that should not exist, and yet it does. It's without a doubt one of the most unconventional studio films of the modern era, maybe just the most unconventional, and a glorious display of pure anarchy to boot. Those things have taken over the projector! They refuse to show the rest of the film! You remember how Ocean's Eleven was so successful that they couldn't not do a sequel, but instead of just doing the same thing again, Steven Soderbergh threw the formula out the window and just made a goofy Richard Linklater-style hangout movie with his buds? Same thing here. And by the way, Ocean's 12 is great. Dante looked at the first Gremlins and said, eh, screw it. Let's do an enormous socio-political satire on consumer culture at a grand scale that'll alienate just about everybody. Take D.W. Griffith commanding an army of thousands, smash it together with David Lean's giant canvas and Jacques Tati's satire, and then blend it all together with Chuck Jones's sense of anarchy, and you've got whatever this beautiful monstrosity is. Everything your society has worked so hard to accomplish over the centuries, that's what we aspire to. We want to be civilized. I mean, you take a look at this trail here. When we talk about massive runaway auteurist visions that took a nosedive at the box office, when we mention titles like Heaven's Gate, Cleopatra, Ishtar, Waterworld, One from the Heart, we always seem to leave out Gremlins 2. Which is a darn shame because this is Dante's Citizen Kane. It's his Rite of Spring, his Modern Times, and quite possibly the greatest Looney Tunes movie ever made. And the fact that it failed to come anywhere close to the first film's box office hall is just all the more poetic in retrospect. This is a movie where you feel like absolutely anything could happen. This is a movie that starts with Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, that kills off Leonard Maltin for writing a bad review, that pokes holes and makes fun of its own rules, that literally breaks down, and that ends with Robert Picardo marrying a gremlin. This may just be the peak of cinema. Doesn't get any better than this. It's all downhill from here, kids. What if they're eating in an airplane and they cross a time zone? I mean, it's always midnight somewhere. <laughs> I digress. You can love the direction that he took the film in, or you can hate it, but this was pretty undeniably Dante's paradise. 
and with all the creative control afforded to him, he decided to do his own spin on one of his favorite movies, the very underrated Hell's a Poppin', which you may not have heard of before, but is very much worth your time. Where's Chick? Hey, how did you get up there? How did you get down there? To be quick about it, this is a movie that begins with Shemp Howard setting up the first reel of a movie, descends into chaos when the characters of that movie walk off set because they can't come to a consensus about what the movie should actually be about, and then go about listening to an up-and-coming screenwriter's pitch. It's a picture about a picture about a writer pitching an idea about what kind of picture Hell's a Poppin' should be. And that just describes the first 10 minutes. After that, it gets nuts. Don't ask me how I do it, folks. <laughs> Louis, operator. Louis. That's what happens when you hire relatives. Like the lyrics of the opening musical numbers suggest, Anything can happen and it probably will. Hell's a poppin'. Now, it would be fun by itself if Dante just set about employing Hell's a Poppin' style gags, but that's only half the picture. He took all of the anarchy of Hell's a Poppin' and proceeded to do his own version of Jacques Tati's Playtime, another massive runaway auteurist division that took a nosedive at the box office. <laughs> In fact, they're kind of the same movie, Gremlins 2 and Playtime. Beyond the fact that they're both packed to the brim with endless gag after gag like a Where's Waldo book, or Where's Wally if you're outside the US, each of them are satires on consumerism that are equally fascinated and disgusted by conformist corporate culture, mindless television, and modern technology as a whole, which for as novel as it may be, always seems to be in a constant state of breaking down. Nothing works around here. Gremlins 2 trades in Playtime's Mall of the Future for a skyscraper of the future, but the old world away from all the gray and chrome of the modern industrial wasteland not only pops up in quiet forgotten corners, but ends up basically saving the day and bringing back a sense of life and charm. But not before the third act descends into complete chaos where everything is destroyed and consumerism pretty much just gloriously implodes. If Jacques Tati had lived long enough to see Gremlins 2, I think he would be proud. You know, Joe Dante has always been quite the political filmmaker. Small soldiers and even back in action have traces of the same anti-consumerist thread. His TV movie The Second Civil War is a pretty biting satire in its own right, same for the Burbs. But Gremlins 2 feels like the most full-on and sharpest statement he's made. It's funny, I look at him, you know what I see? What's that, sir? Dolls with suction cups staring out car windows. A big float in the Macy's Day Parade. Has anybody ever talked to you about merchandising? It's an angry little movie and it wants you to know it, and yet it still somehow manages to be gleeful and good-natured and just joyful the whole way through. It's the kind of movie you'd never expect, that you could never predict, and yet by some dark magic it got made. It's a movie that slaps the idea of market testing in the face, because who would ever approve of this? It gives the finger to the idea of plot holes and canon, and it's the kind of movie we'll probably never get again on this kind of scale. The closest thing since you could argue would be something like, I don't know, Deadpool? Which was okay for what it was and did have something of an anarchic spirit, but nowhere to the extent of Gremlins 2. Do I have to come up there myself? Do you think the Grimsters can stand up to the Hulkster? Well, if I were you, I'd run the rest of Gremlins too, right now! Sorry folks, it won't happen again. Again, it's almost like leaving talented people alone to just do their thing results in really great films. Who would have thought?
as I mentioned, like back in Action and Explorers, Gremlins 2 was a pretty significant flop. And this is, of course, where our metaphor starts to break down, because in real life, Dante's Inferno came after Paradise. Not before, as it did with whoever this guy was. And ever since Gremlins 2 was released in 1990, Dante has had more and more of a limited theatrical career, with larger and larger gaps between each film, and after the debacle of Looney Tunes back in action has retreated from studio films entirely. It's kind of a sad thing, really. Dante, like a lot of his contemporaries, great genre filmmakers like John Landis and Terry Gilliam and John Carpenter, David Cronenberg, Joe Johnston, Brian De Palma, directors with big ideas and even bigger ambitions and who actually have something to say, have largely been written off and pushed aside in favor of Yes Men, who will just shut up and make the boring, straightforward Gremlin sequel, WB1, and where everything's just safely done exactly the same way again. There's a theory that gets tossed around sometimes that says directors are like tuning forks. They strike hot with their first few films, and for a while things stay in tune, but eventually it fades away and never comes back. And there's a kernel of truth to that. Directors certainly go out of favor, and there are those directors whose later films lack the creative spark that made the best of their films so good. But it's not something that's written in stone because for every aging director who's gone out of favor or who's lost some of their creative spark, there's another one still churning out great work. And there's no reason to think that Joe Dante couldn't belong to the same camp. And despite the fact that he and Hollywood have ostensibly gone their separate ways, his is still ultimately an inspiring and encouraging story. When things got really bad during the making of Explorers, Dante seriously considered leaving the project to the point of actually sitting down and writing out a resignation letter. But he chose not to send it and to see the film through even though he very likely knew that the final product wasn't going to be the movie he set out to make. And that's characteristic of one of the primary themes of Dante's Divine Comedy. Persistence through even the very worst. That's the real story of Joe Dante's battle with Hollywood. <laughs> Cooking shouldn't have to be this difficult. That's why I want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh. You know, editing these videos is often a really intensive process that has a tendency to take a lot of time away from other areas of my life, including setting aside the right amount of time to shop and to cook throughout the week. And that's where HelloFresh has been a really great solution for me. They are a wonderful meal kit service that delivers delicious, healthy meals straight to your door every week. And they cut out any and all meal prepping and planning, which frankly can be a little bit stressful for those of us who are culinarily challenged. On the contrary, the recipe guides they provide are not only easy to follow, but help save you time as each meal only takes about 30 minutes to cook. Plus, they're a really flexible service to work with. If you want, you can add extra dinners or lunches, you can throw in additional proteins, you can easily change your selected delivery day, you can adjust your food preferences, you can even skip a week whenever you need. I've been using HelloFresh over the past couple of weeks while I've been making this video, and I can honestly say that it's been really enjoyable and that the meals themselves are delicious. And right now, they're offering an incredible deal. You can go to HelloFresh.com and use the code ROYALOCEAN14 to get 14 free meals plus free shipping. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, I can't recommend it enough. And by trying it out, it's also a great way of supporting my channel. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back very soon with the conclusion of this summer series. I can't wait to share it with you guys. I'll see you soon.